Welcome, and thank you for joining today's National Industrial Security Program Policy Advisory Committee meeting, also known as the NISPAC. To receive all pertinent information about upcoming NISPAC meetings, please subscribe to the Information Security Oversight Office's overview blog at isoo-overview.blogs.archives.gov or go to the Federal Register. All available meeting materials, including today's agenda, slides, and biographies for NISPAC members and speakers have been posted to the ISOO website at www.archives.gov slash ISOO slash oversight dash groups slash NISPAC slash committee dot HTML and have also been emailed to all registrants. Please note not all NISPAC members and speakers have biographies or slides. For those joining us online, while connecting by phone is necessary to attend today's meeting, there is no requirement to log on to WebEx. However, you're welcome to join with the link provided with your registration, as all available materials will be shared during the meeting on that platform. If you have connected through WebEx, please ensure you have opened the participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a private chat message to the event producer. Please note all audio connections will be muted for the duration of the meeting, with the exception of NISPAC members, speakers, and ISU. We are expecting a fairly large audience today, both in person and virtually. Because of this, we will not be taking questions from the public. Please email your questions and comments to nispac at nara.gov, and someone will answer your questions there. Only ISU and NISPAC members will be authorized to ask questions throughout the meeting. This is a public meeting. Like previous NISPAC meetings, this will be recorded. This recording, along with the transcript and minutes, will be available within 90 days on the NISPAC Reports on Committee Activities webpage mentioned earlier. At the conclusion, a survey will be provided for feedback. If you would like to be contacted regarding your survey responses, please include your email in the comments block so the NISPAC team can get back to you personally. Let me now turn things over to Mr. Mark Bradley, the Director of ISU, as well as the Chairman of the NISPAC. Thank you so much, Madam Producer. Uh, welcome, everybody. I hope you're having a nice time in, in New Orleans. I had hoped to be retired uh, this time around uh, when, when, this, when the, the date came around again for the NISPAC. I was told by HR you can retire either at the beginning of the month or well, the end of the month, and our annual report just came out uh, today, so it'll be the end of the month. So June 30th will be my last uh, day in the government. And so anyway, I decided it was best uh, to stay here and, and work on that and get that out. But you're in very capable hands with Harris, Heather Pagone, and my staff. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Heather, and have you uh, run today's meeting. We had some technical challenges last time we, we did this when you all were, were down at your conference, so I thought it was best just to try to keep this as smooth and as clean as, uh, as possible. So without further ado, Heather, if you would please uh, take over, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. We have the meeting scheduled for three hours, but I expect it to be finished, and you can have some of your time back. During the director of ISO and chairman of the NISPAC, Bradley was going to retire for this meeting. However, he has put his retirement to the end of this month. As he stated, he does not expect to interact much during the public meeting, but will be on the call if needed. I am now going to turn it over to Mr. Robert Tringali, the alternate designated federal officer for the NIPAC for some administrative action. Robert? Thank you, Heather. I will now begin attendance for the government members. I will state the name of the agency, then the agency member will reply by identifying themselves. Once I've gone through the government members, I will then move over to the industry members. After the industry members, I will then proceed to the speakers. ODNI? Hello, Robert. It's Valerie Kerbin, primary, and Lisa Perez is alternate. Oh, thank you. Uh, DOD? Good afternoon, Robert. This is Jeff Spinninger. Hi, Jeff. DOE? Good afternoon, Robert. Mark Hanofsky uh, is on as primary. Tracy Kendall is secondary. Very good. Thank you. NRC? Good afternoon, Robert. Dennis Brady is primary. Chris Heilick is alternate. Thank you. 
DHS. Yes, good afternoon. This is uh, Robert McCray here. Perfect, thank you. DCSA. Good afternoon, Keith Minard. Hi, Keith. Good afternoon, Mike. Great. Great. Oh, CIA. Good afternoon, this is Kelly that. Patrick. Thank you. Um, Commerce. Good afternoon, this is Steve Barbieri. Hi, Steve. DOJ. Good afternoon, this is Tanya Fields, and my alternate is Kathleen Berry. Good, thank you. NASA. Vaughn, was, did you call in earlier? NSA. Is Matt there? Air Force. Good afternoon, Jennifer Aquinas here along with Annie Backus. Thank you. Navy. Good afternoon, Robert. Christopher Crystal, the primary, and Robin Nichols as alternate. Great, thank you. Army. Army is not you, Robert. Okay, thank you. Okay, now I'm going to turn to the industry members. Heather Sims. April Abbott. April Abbott present. Okay, thank you. Uh, Derek Jones. Derek Jones present. Great. Tracy Durkin. Tracy Durkin present. Thank you. Greg Sadler. Greg Sadler present. Great, thank you. Uh, Dave Tender. Ike Rivers. Rivers present. Thank you. Jane Dinkle. Jane Dinkle, present. Thank you. Now we'll do a roll call for the speakers. Mark Bradley. Here, Robert. Thank you, Mark. Jen. Dave Scott. Dave Scott, present. Mike Ray. Mike Ray, present. Thank you. Tracy Kendall. Present. Thank you, Chris Heilig. Present. Thank you. Perry Russell Hunter. Perry Russell Hunter, present. Thank you. If anyone else is speaking during the NISPAC that we've not heard from or we don't know about, please speak now. Okay, thank you. Robert Mark Noski will be speaking also for DOE. Okay, very good. Okay, we request that everyone identify themselves by name and agency, if applicable, before speaking each time for the record. I want to provide everyone with our agency's COVID update. Most of the ISO staff is still teleworking. Hopefully, the next NISPAC will be in person at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. I want to remind the government membership of the requirement to annually file a financial disclosure report with the National Archives and Record Administration, Office of General Counsel. Before a government member may serve on the NISPAC and annually thereafter, this must be done. The same form for financial disclosure that is used throughout the federal government, OGE Form 450, satisfies the reporting document. Additionally, we have had several changes to the NISPAC membership. As a reminder, in accordance with the NISPAC bylaws, a letter signed by the agency head of the senior agency official for the NISP is required for participation. As mentioned earlier, Mark Bradley will be retiring later this month. CIA alternates John and Michelle have been replaced by Jennifer and Kelly. The Department of Justice primary mem member Christine Gunning has been replaced by Tanya Fields. Brad Weatherby, the National Security Agency primary member, has been replaced by Matthew Armstrong. Kyla Power has been replaced as the alternate for ODNI by Lisa Perez. Steve James, the primary with the Navy, has been replaced by Mr. Christopher Chrislip. Emily Helstowski, who is the alternate for the Army, has departed. State Department members Kim Bauer and Matthew Hawk have both retired, but a new member for state has not yet been designated in writing. Valerie Kerbin is on her last NISPAC public meeting as well and is due to retire at the end of July. Heather Sims and April Abbott are representing NISPAC industry for their last public meeting before being replaced at the next meeting. <clears throat> Excuse me. For those departed members, thank you all for your contribution over the years. We look forward to continuing the work you have done with the new representatives. I will now turn it over to Heather harris Pagan to address the items of interest from the November 2nd, 2022 NISPAC public meeting. 
Thank you, sir. The NISAC minutes from the last meeting were certified to be true and correct and were finalized by me on January 30th, 2023, and were posted to the IC website the next day. Since the last NISPAC, we continue to work ISU notice discussing the Small Business Administration Regulation, finding their mentor pro J programs issued in the fall of 2020. The SBA rule appears to eliminate the requirement for a joint venture to have an entity eligibility determination, or EED, also known as a facility clearance, or FCL. In all cases, if entities making up a joint venture already have the EEDs themselves, However, the interpretation of the regulation language is not what the regulation tends and would contradict NIST requirements. In coordination with SBA, we will be issuing an ICU notice to clarify the joint venture EED requirements. Additionally, we continue to have discussions for NIST entity cost collection with the government and security agencies and offices, also known as CSAs and CSOs. The collection is required by executive order. The costs that will be collected will include information on its implementation costs incurred by entities under their security cognizance. Once finalized, we will advise the NISP chair on the way to move forward collecting the staff for industry's implementation of the NISP. The final item of interest from the last NISPAC meeting is that industry was going to start meeting with DCSA about concerns for how long it takes for a company to get cleared. DCSA did a 90-day internal study and made some process improvement. However, industry is still concerned with process transparency and return rates. I also have some other updates to provide. ISU has been going through a great many changes with leadership. We just got a new archivist on board a few weeks ago. We also recently got two new program analysts that have been hired. As you know, our director is retiring at the end of this month. ISU is planning on hiring a deputy director, and once they are hired, they will become an acting director. Any NISPAC members have any questions? All right, fantastic. Ms. Heather Sims, NISPAC industry spokesperson, will provide industry updates. Thanks, everybody. And uh, as you heard, this is my last public NISPAC meeting. It's been a pleasure to serve. Um, that cleared industry population for the past four years, but I am ready for a vacation. Um, and I'd like to thank April, who's also coming off with me um, this year, and all the other industry news pack members, past and present, and all the industry members that um, support us through your input, and then also issues, complaints, what's going well. We're definitely open to any and all of your suggestions. I do want to um, give a personal thanks to ISU. Um, I see the director, Mark Bradley, thank you for your support over the past four years. Good luck with your retirement. And to um, Heather harris Begun for all your support um, for industry, as well as all of the entire of this pack. So we thank you for that. We are in the middle of our election process where we will be elected two new members to sit on for industry. Um, I encourage you, um, if you would like a challenge, we would like to present all of industry. And that's not just those represented by the DOD, um, under the cognizance, it's all five CSAs. So I encourage you to get on, um, expand the aperture of understanding of the NIST, but also expand the knowledge of how it works um, within government to make good positive change on behalf of national security. Um, I will say that the election, um, two people out of the uh, over a million um, cleared um, for now, um, it's a very tight um, race, so if you don't get on the time, don't discourage and keep trying to, uh, to work through that. Get with one of the elected industry NISPAC members um, if you're interested in participating or would like to be nominated through that process. So I came up with a few strategic topics up there, and I'm strategic because while we would love to tackle every single industry issue, um, we can only do that um, at strategic level, there's only so much time for our volunteers. So we did it put in buckets. We put, you know, we're having the elections, but also the next one's partnership, because it all started with partnership. And we tend to think of partnership only, you know, with DCSA, DOD, but a partnership with all of the federal government, with your contracting officers or the cores, but also within industry itself, partnering with other companies. Uh, for the benefit of uh, protecting national security, um, but also mentoring. And CMS does a fabulous job with the mentoring program of getting that next generation of secure professionals 
to understand the importance of the national security program. But with partnership, you know, I can't be remiss if I didn't say and at least acknowledge the great partnership we have, you know, done over the past couple of years. And the to my right, um, Mr. Keith Menard, is also going to be coming off the NISAC um, after, I believe he told me, 16 years um, of attending, 16, 16 sessions of attending the, the public meeting. Uh, without his partnership, we wouldn't be where we are today. So it's been, it's been a pleasure to work with you, Keith, on the NISPAC. Matt Roche, who's also with DCSA, he's been a true partner with CSA, and actually not just listening, but hearing industry's concerns are, and working with us to help get that path forward. We might not always like the answer, because they are the government, but at least he can understand the place that we have uh, here in the industry. I'd also like to thank CDSC for all the great products, training, um, and educational brochures that they provide to industry. They go above and beyond each year of providing uh, valuable information, insight to uh, what we can do with the NISP. And then also Michael Ray, who's up here with me, um, tremendous job. Um, he and Heather Green have really taken the personnel security investigation adjudication mission and now continuing his vetting to next level. And they didn't do that within a vacuum. They worked with industry proactively to where we are today. And I'm going to leave it open to my other uh, Indigenous PAC members if you would like to acknowledge somebody publicly for great partnership. Hey, Heather. Um just want to extend a, a thank you and a continued partnership with uh, Scott and his team, not only me, but the regional arrows have modeled that partnership for years. We've moved beyond, you know, discussions about issues with EMAS and to allow us to tackle cloud and, and other complex projects and, and efforts within the government returning assistance. So thank you. Also, Oh, sorry about that. Also, Ike Rivers, the industry in this I also wanted to uh, give a big special thanks to uh, Booker Bland um, DCSA, um, from DCSA from a DCSA CUI perspective. The transparency there has been phenomenal. Um, Booker uh, uh, goes as far as reaching out and going face to face to the different industry companies to ensure that the transparency is there when it comes to DCSA CUI. So I want to just say thank you, Booker Bland. I'd like to say thank you to Matt Ames. He's, he's recently started the uh, industry uh, tour. He's worked with uh, the other organizations, ISWIG, um, NISPEC, PPC, and many others. Good example, we had a meeting last week, and I mentioned um, training reciprocity because I talked about it before, and I, I said I have the draft white papers that I owe. And after the call, immediately uh, gave uh, Kathy Pearson a task team and a paper on it. So I, I appreciate his collaboration and thinking outside the box. Okay, and from uh, the NIST Systems Working Group, we um, were working hard with the um, DCSA onboarding team. Johnny Lewis and um, phenomenal partners with the industry team and the industry team itself who works hard three or four times a week to get into where it is now today. Jane Dinkle with Industry NISPAC. I also want to just really acknowledge the demonstration of the partnership of DCSA with the NISPAC. I know recently that DCSA had uh, communicated to industry transition from the DSS Form 147 to DCSA Form 147, which is really quite an undertaking. And um, after speaking with the CSA, they have agreed to take me on that transition and so they can work with this path to develop a plan to move forward with that. So I, I just think that's a great example of listening to the NISPAC and being willing to part with us to develop a plan. Good, thank you. And I know many of you in the audience and on the telephone, it's not all sunshine and rainbows, and we're not trying to portray that. We do want to acknowledge that the, with the partnerships, it does drive good behavior. We want to become more proactive partners in national security and not an afterthought. But my next topic is really goes to the, to the root of where industry really wants to hear is um, driving behavior, good, bad, and different. When the government puts in a new requirement, it often results in unfunded mandates. Um, but we do have to understand that there are costs of doing business. We sign up for the contract. And so once they drive behavior, I say let's hold ourselves accountable as industry members to make sure security professionals were involved in the contracting process and we're looking at actually in the contract before our companies sign up for that. 
sometimes that's an after, um, you know, an afterthought. And so that happens it's too far gone. We have to, you know, make those decisions. So there is a cost of doing business with the government, but we should be able to be um, foundational in those security processes, the first part. The other thing um, with the audience here for, for industry members is um, driving um, the new right model and rating. So we understand that's a big issue with um, industry at the moment. We are hearing lots of concerns coming in from small, medium, and large companies, predominantly those medium, larger companies, but it is an impact to uh, all the companies that are out there. We are um, capturing that information, passing it over to DCA and also taking a look at how we'd be more proactively working with DCSA on that. The um, rating structure and the assessment process is outlined in 32 CFR, so it is policy. So considering that this is the NISPAC and we are fundamentally there to view policy, make recommendations to policy, we would like to um, put a motion out to potentially look at the 32 CFR to make potential changes to that oversight and rating process for the CSA. Now, the um, a part of that is keeping industry informed. We have a due diligence within industry to make sure we're keeping ourselves informed. Changes happening every, every day, not only with the emerging threat, but also with things that are happening in the policy and how we implement that policy. So making sure that we're keeping each other informed, checking the DCSA website on a reoccurring basis. I'm surprised often how many people don't even know the information is out there. It's been out there for years. But just staying informed with legislation, making sure you're reading the 32 CFR um, Part 117, but also for our government partners, understanding that um, we know that you are um, hindered sometimes because of policy that you can't share all the information. Hope we can get to a point where we are sharing information from government to government, from government to industry, and industry to industry. So improving that, and I do know that we have. Um, in the, one of the MOU working groups worked on some papers um, to increase the information sharing. That is so important, but for industry listening, make sure you're doing part of keeping yourself informed and also understand policy. And if something doesn't make sense or if you're getting good interpretation, please don't be afraid to reach out to one of the industry NISPAC members so we can collect to see if it's a trend or it's a one-off, see maybe we need some additional guidance to the policy or if we need to work on changing that policy. Um, Tracy already mentioned that EAMS and uh, Trusted Workforce 2.0. This has definitely been a reform many, many years in the making and something that we need to do. Um, and so we are very happy that, that Matt EAMS is working proactively with industry and getting our involvement in understanding what those impacts are and impediments to industry um, that we may have when the Trusted Workforce 2.0 is rolled out completely. So thank you, Matt Ains, for that. I look forward to many, many more years and seeing the fruit to that labor for years to come. More than likely, I will be retired completely before we see how the benefits of that, but we look forward to it. Um, when it comes to safeguarding, there's been a lot of changes, not only in the v 2 CFR, but many of you that um, have gifts and um, additional requirements, you've noticed that there's been a couple of changes, some letters that came out. So we are looking, working a little bit more aggressively within this past working group when it comes to safeguarding. Jane um, did mention about the 147, and there's a great partnership working with DCSA, taking in until we can figure out what is the best way moving forward. And that's an example of driving behaviors. Some companies have upward to um, hundreds of areas that have to reaccomplish the paperwork. So there is a requirement when it comes to only, you know, time commitments to changing those. We do thank DCSA for working with the industry, understanding that impact there. But we're also looking for um, ODNI on the, the tennis um, front, understanding what that threat is that's driving this change. Um, we look forward to contact with um, ODNI and the information sharing. Anything from industry in this pack and what I said so far? No, Heather, this is Greg Stather. The, the push for improved infrastructure and facilities is, is a great direction, but understanding the cost structure and how industry is able to adapt to that is, is something we need to improve on and work forward. Thank you for that. <clears throat> and I have up here CUI and CMMD. I think it's a favorite for everybody, but 
we're, we're to a point now where we understand that we are losing sensitive information to our adversaries and we do have to protect information. What we ask for from our government partners, and, and thank you, Tucker Boyland, again, DCSA, for your partnership there on hearing industries concerned because the industry is unique in that they have many, many contracts, some up to 10 to 20,000 contracts in some companies. And when you have 10 to 20,000 varying degrees of UI guidance, it is an impact to the workforce. So understanding what are the requirements, how industry is rolling that out, and then what is the true intent of the policy. So we look forward to working with all five DSAs in the future to better understand UI. But I would also like to um, congratulate industry because I believe we have some of the strongest UI programs far exceeding some of our government partners that are out there putting your programs in place. So we do commend you for putting those processes and procedures in place. And lastly, I have up to CSA topics. Um, and just to be mindful, and especially since this is our first public person meeting in many, many years, to remind um, industry that there are five CSAs, and DOD being one of them, DCSA works on behalf of DOD. And so remember that when you're dealing with your industrial security rep, um, we always ask that you work with your rep first, so you work with your field office chief, your regional director, and others up the chain. But there are other avenues when you have issues that you can resolve there. And as we collect trends from across the country, we're looking for trends, not just one-offs, but we're looking for trends we can work down at this level where we can affect the change at the national level strategically. And so why I like to say we have lots of complaints, we do. We are working with many, many issues into vetting, and that includes folk guide vetting as well as SCL timeline. DCSA did a 90-day study, and we saw some of the results, but there are still some improvements that need to be done along the way. So through the clearance working groups on this pack, we are working with DCSA on some of those improvements. Um, and I know my colleague to my right is gonna talk a little bit about entity vetting, but there's one um, area, if it has affected you yet, um, it may affect you in the very future when it comes to so your supply chain, getting companies cleared, um, not as quickly as possible, but understanding that we have to get them cleared to get to work, but making sure that we understand the transparent process. And so I'll open up to my other colleagues in the industry in the fact if there's any other CSA topics. Yeah, uh, Ike Rivers and uh, industry news that not a CSA topic, but a thank you to you. For the last four years, you have been a phenomenal sport spokesperson for the industry in this past. Um, not only from the industry side, um, from the government side, you're very well respected. And we just want to say thank you for your leadership, your dedication, your loyalty, your integrity, and your honesty. And we know although you won't be part of this, you will still be part of this. Um, so thank you very much for all you have done for the industry and the government. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, it's been a pleasure. Tracy from industry, I just want to say, do what he said because it's a thankless job. And I, and, and you know, we sit up here and we thank everybody. Heather is has been totally committed for the last four years, and she she's, she has spoken the voice of industry, and you've done it excellent. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. As you know, you will be missed beyond measure by probably everyone at the table. So thank you for everything. Mr. Spinninger, the Director for Critical Technology Protection for the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, will give the update on behalf of the Department of Defense as the NISP Executive Agent. Jeff? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, from the uh, windowless basement of the Pentagon. Um, uh, first, I, I'd like to start off by, uh, you know, just uh, it, it, it seems like we're having to do this with some routine, uh, but it's it's kind of the nature of things uh, and, and, and maybe the nature of the NISPAC. But uh, to, to Mark Bradley, uh, you know, and, and your, on your last NISPAC, um, uh, and regardless of the reasons why uh, that you uh, have been extended for this one, uh, I'm glad for it. Um, I think it's an important opportunity to, uh, to, to thank you for your many years of service uh, to the NISPAC. Um, 
I think if you had a picture dictionary definition of what a thankless job might be, um, yours might be a leading candidate. Um, um, not, not a lot of folks think about ISU um, unless there's a, a calamity of one type or another. And uh, you've always been a gentleman. Uh, you weather those things uh, effortlessly, and we're all the better for it. So uh, I, I thank you very, very much uh, on behalf of the department. Um, uh, along the same lines, right, as, as we start to, to, to line up and see all the, the folks that are leaving, uh, you know, uh, Heather was mentioned in April and, and, uh, and, and many others. Uh, you know, Keith is getting roll off after 937 um, NISPACs. Um, you, know, um, you know, we're bookending here. A lot of this kind of began with the departure of Valerie Heil now almost two years ago, two, two plus years ago, uh, and as, uh, as this uh, was announced today as Valerie Kerbins, right? Uh, I, I can't help but think of the uh, the amount of, of um, experience that is reflected there uh, in the NISPAC. and I, it reminds me though that I that that if we were to go back into the into the history a little bit, we will have seen periods uh, where, where similar things have have, uh, have, have occurred. Uh, I, I can think of some of the the folks that I think of as mentors, uh, you know, when I was coming up in this world a little bit. Uh, and the reliance that they had then on this pack and that we all need to have now um, because future experts and ex uh, and uh, and uh, you know that uh, and collaborators uh, you know both within government across government and then certainly out in industry um, the, the the fulcrum that we all can uh, can pivot on and operate through uh, is this body um, I don't know that we say that enough uh, I think uh, you know we've uh, you know, in this little quasi-virtual uh, setup that we're at, uh, where I understand there's about 150 or so folks in person. That's fantastic. I, I'm, I'm sad that, that I'm not there, and, and honestly not just because it's in New Orleans, which is a, a wonderful city, but uh, just because it's the, it's the formal aspects of these things and it's what happens, uh, you know, in the lead-up uh, and uh, during the break and, and subsequent, right? Those are important discussions. Uh, there are important opportunities for folks who don't get to spend a lot of time together to talk about weighty issues uh, that uh, that Heather uh, laid out, and, and frankly, that I'll probably touch on a little bit when I get into my formal remarks. But uh, that is the importance of this forum. That is the importance of ISU uh, as a, as the great facilitator of it. Um, but it's also incumbent on all of us, those who are rolling off, uh, as you start to. To look and I, to identify, you know, uh, you know, the people who are going to fill your 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 shoes, um, uh, you know, um, uh, and uh, and carry this forward because it's those uh, those processes, the deliberate nature of this um, this body uh, that puts accountability into uh, into what we do, right? Um, you know, Heather again said it right. I mean, uh, we're it, this isn't a mutual admiration society, uh, and it's not a place where we can. Uh, you know, achieve, um, you know, nirvana where we all agree about everything all the time. Uh, I think we agree about the big things uh, as it relates to the safeguarding of classified information all of the time. Uh, you know, the details are uh, and the timing of things, uh, you know, uh, across the complexities of, of the government, any one agency or certainly the sum of all of them. And then, of course, uh, the, the same is, is equally true and in some ways even more complicated across the vastness of the industrial base uh, that we rely so heavily on uh, to both build uh, capability and also to protect, uh, you know, that information that, uh, that, uh, that you all, uh, um, you, know, um, you know, sign up, uh, you know, to, uh, to safeguard. So, so anyway, um, with that, uh, again, that's, uh, that, that to me is a twofer. I, I hope that, you know, the folks that are out there in the audience who are vying for, you know, those, those slots that are coming open within industry and then uh, as the transitions begin, some for the, whom uh, they've been identified as, uh, as, as replacements uh, across government. Um, but I, I hope we can, uh, you know, continue to measure up to uh, the outstanding example. Uh, and, and again, Mark, that all really frankly begins with you. So thank you very much. Um, moving into the meat of uh, some of the topics that we wanted to discuss, right, we've tried to continue to be a bit of a steady drum as it relates to um, uh, you know, a number of topics, uh, uh, you know, of, of what we think of, of importance, um, relevance to the NISP uh, and uh, relevance to the, where the department, uh, uh, as it continues its implementation of the National Defense Strategy, uh, it will will and well does and will continue to rely very heavily. Uh, one of those, uh, as it relates to, um, uh, is cloud, right? So, 
uh, to the folks at DCSA uh, and others who, um, uh, you know, who participated in a recent pilot effort uh, that uh, concluded uh, that we, we, there is a pathway to cloud authorization uh, where the NISP is concerned. Um, uh, you know, um, regulatory policy is not, not easy. Um, we try to write it at a simple level, um, um, but we may all not have the same working definition of simple. Um, but nonetheless, uh, through a, a lot of adroit cooperation, um, we, uh, we have a sense of what it looks like, uh, you know, as DCSA and DISA on the government side and, and certainly uh, you know, across kind of the complicated landscape of what government requirements need to look like. We are identifying other challenge areas, but we are moving forward, and I'm really pleased with that. We would not have been able to do that, though, uh, if not for uh, some willing participants within industry who took on some risk. Uh, and all the ways in which you all define it to, uh, to patiently work with us to get to this point. So, um, again, uh, kind of with a nod to the NISPAC, um, being able to talk about these things in a forum where everything's on the record, uh, you know, puts some accountability to helps us move forward. Um, you know, we also, that it also gives us the opportunity to, to reflect a little bit once we get to a place where we have some achievement, understand, understand how we got here, how long it took, what, what can we do to continue to iterate the process, uh, make refinements and improvements, uh, including it when necessary, uh, you know, revisions to policy, um, but more, more about, uh, you know, consideration for how, how we apply that. And so with that right now, that's where we find ourselves today. Uh, much of what we're, our aim points uh, right now are really to, to help with our acquisition partners to understand some of the implementing DFAR clauses uh, that, that really enable, uh, but also maybe uh, create some I'm going to use the word confusion, even uh, even though that might not be that might be too strong a word, um, but it is a Monday, uh, so why not? And uh, and so we're trying to you know examine uh, the extent to which uh, the, you know clauses that were written several years ago, uh, you know if there the, some of the vagaries which are intended to allow for flexibility, um, uh, you know you know across the, the complex landscape of contracts. Um, uh, you know, might actually be, uh, be be one of the impediments to allowing us to move forward quite, uh, you know, more 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 quickly. And so, uh, that's a little bit of work with our acquisition partners. But while we continue to to work with them, uh, we have uh, you know proposed some guidance and, and of course testament to DCSA and, and especially to keep uh, Miner. We kind of dream up a problem, and then he comes up with 13 different solutions to it. Uh, which he's already done, uh, and, and you know, I'm sure when he speaks, he'll be the last person to take all the credit, but I'm going to pass it his way because it's Monday and I've got the mic. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, but in, the, in the near term, uh, you know, where we can, we can see, uh, you know, to, to issuing some guidance uh, that would allow for some specificity on 254s uh, that would help to overcome some of those vagaries that exist on the DFAR clauses that put this together. That is a bit of a complex word salad uh, to say, uh, so we're, we're trying to simplify that when it comes to actual writing things on a 254. It does become a bit of a nod to uh, another of a DCSA initiative that's been several years in play. I want to uh, you know, continue to give credit for, and that's the, the, the work that they've done to, to, uh, to automate, to, to, bring, uh, to bring technology to bear where, um, where 254 is our concern and in this contract classification system. I think Keith's going to speak to that a little bit more, but, um, but bringing these thing, two things together will help us uh, and uh, being able to be more help us to be more observant in the uh, in the uh, in the oversight layer uh, as those who who uh, set about to execute uh, you know system requirements uh, you know look to turn the crank with greater frequency where cloud is concerned. So um, we're we're excited by about what that looks like. We're keen to see it go into practice, but. Um, mostly, I want to say, you know, the, hang in there with us, right? We are making a lot of progress. I know the appetites will continue to grow. Uh, we want to manage that where we can, um, and um, and, uh, and and continue to see progress. So I'll I'll continue to beat this drum, uh, and uh, as as uh, as as, as uh, you know, far in the future as we can until we're we think that we're uh, kind of running in more of a deliberate and normal uh, normal order of business for uh, for for cloud. Um, so um, uh, along the same lines, right, and so a nod to uh, nice thing about following Heather uh, is that she lays out most of the topics that I intended to discuss anyway, uh, which is super helpful. And so one on the DIFF's um, cybersecurity uh, front, right, so which um, 
there's four letters that I'm not going to say uh, that she did say where, where DIV cybersecurity is concerned. Um, but I will say those three magic little letters in that CY. Um, uh, and, and essentially what, what you may be tracking, I hope you're aware, but the DIV cybersecurity federal rule um, that requires uh, DOD contractors to report cyber incidents involving covered defense information um, uh, is, uh, is up for some revision. Uh, the rule was recently updated in May and expanded to include contractors who handle CUI to participate in the voluntary program uh, to share cyber threat information and best practices with and with DIPCS participants. Um, uh, it's also, it, it, traditionally the DIPCS program has been oriented uh, exclusively uh, around and, uh, and focused on clear defense contractors. One of the major proposed uh, changes is, uh, is to expand that. Uh, to, uh, to the broader uh, defense industrial base, um, many of whom uh, obviously uh, in their support to the department, that, that support comes uh, as part of supply chains for, uh, for, uh, for cleared contractors. So um, uh, it's one of those things where, where writing that down is, isn't all that difficult, but as we start to think about what it might look like in implementation, it's definitely something we look forward to hearing from, uh, from industry on, uh, and that will help to anticipate what the sense of scale um, that uh, that the, the government may, uh, may may anticipate both as a function of uh, supporting the program, receiving from it, and feeding to it. Uh, so um, if you haven't done so already, I think the uh, the comment period is I, I think it's in its nascent stages. Um, I live to provide uh, homework assignments for Stacy Bustanic, many of whom you know. Uh, so well, we can figure out ways for you to be in contact with she and her team. Um, uh, and, and she's been out there kind of beating the drum on this for, for a while. So, uh, so, so please, by all means, uh, take a moment to take a look at it uh, and, uh, and, and um, we welcome uh, your uh, perspective. Um, along that same lines, that implementing uh, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the driving pr uh, premium on the DIBCS program, right, looking at non-federal systems, unclassified systems, uh, systems that process, process unclassified information, of course, one of the driving, uh, you know, um, aim points that we have are, uh, as it relates to those three little uh, letters, uh, controlled and classified information. And so, again, uh, just a little light reading uh, for, for those of you who are sitting down on, um, you know, listening to jazz music and, uh, and eating delicious food, um, I would commend you to the DOD IG website, um, who um, last Friday published uh, uh, their findings related to on this, an evaluation of the DOD uh, count, um, controlled and classified information program, both where we are uh, and, uh, and where we're headed. Uh, I would have mentioned it regardless um, because that's kind of the nature of this. this accountability it isn't just about good news, it's about all news. Um, but in this particular case, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the findings are, uh, you know, generally um, complementary of the department's program where we are today. Um, uh, you know, in, in what we call our limited implementation of the federal rule. Uh, those of you who have not read the federal rule, you should peruse this quite complex and, and, and quite sweeping on, in, its, uh, in its aim points and objectives. Um, again, with a nod to Mark Bradley, back when the department put its program into, into, uh, into issuance and ultimately got it, uh, got it signed out um, almost uh, a little over three years ago now, uh, we would not have been able to do so without, um, without you know, the, uh, the support of Mark Bradley to accept the, the way in which the department moved into its present implementation, um, and uh, that's, uh, that, that's, uh, that's no small thing, um, and um, um, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're pr pretty pleased with it. The IG report goes a little like this, you know, hey, the department's policy uh, is, is, uh, is, is established uh, and, and, and up and running. Uh, it should be running a bit more efficiently. So there's some homework that's assigned to, uh, you know, kind of across at a department level uh, that, that my office is responsible for. We accepted all of those comments and, and, uh, and, and have provided a, a poem for, for how we continue to move forward, mindful of, of, uh, of the fact that, uh, of course, we're um, we're anticipating some direction uh, to come out of the, uh, the NSC initiative that is, um, uh, is, is still ongoing on the subject. But also a little bit of a uh, lineup to, uh, you know, uh, as we get a little deeper into the department where, uh, where we need additional guidance uh, from, uh, you know, individual components, right, at a component level. 
Um, and so that's, um, again, one of those places where that's not hard to write. It's, it's a little bit challenging to think about, um, you know, again, with a nod to something that Heather said where, where there are many, many programs out there in industry that, uh, that can, you know, maybe, uh, you know, point to themselves as, uh, as having uh, best practices. I think that's true. One thing that we can ante uh, definitely anticipate needing from industry uh, as as, sub, uh, as additional um, guidance comes out from stakeholders, right? So large stakeholders, the military departments, uh, you know, getting down into into smaller stakeholders. All of those roads, or at least many of those roads, lead to industry. And so we will look for uh, to to hear from you all to make sure that uh, that we have as much consistency as we can muster as those programs continue to mature. Um, that is again another nod to this forum. Um, uh, you know, not not just uh, uh, you know as it relates to the industrial security program, but I think it becomes a good um, venue for uh, input to ISU and its in its broader responsibilities. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Since the last time we met, we uh, we uh, we went through and, and uh, have gotten uh, out out and now issued the the uh, Department of Defense instruction for the National Industrial Security Program. Uh, so high degree of redundancy uh, between what's in the DOD instruction now and, of course, what's in the, in the NISPOM um, uh, which, or an alignment, right? So this was an update that, uh, that we wanted to, to make sure there was alignment. That's not that easy to do. Um, but the policy contains a couple of very important provisions that I think are, are worth, uh, worth your time this afternoon, the first of which uh, is, a, is a nod back to what I mentioned earlier, which is a requirement for government contracting activities to use the, uh, the NISP contract classification system, NCCS, uh, that DCSA has, uh, has worked so diligently, um, one, to advocate for it to become a rule, and then two, to, to build and actually now field, uh, you know, um, what uh, folks who are a little bit closer to the practitioner layer say is a, is a very functioning system. Um, it's uh, looking forward to having some data put into it, so um, so uh, so we're happy to see that in the instruction uh, creates again that, that uniform requirement uh, that we'll continue to to, uh, to to be observant of uh, you know here as uh, as the, the, com the components and defense agencies begin uh, begin the the, uh, the implementation process. And then the second, um, uh, again, with particular nod to industry, was uh, a, you know pretty important delegation of, of authority, right? So for the issuances of, of industrial security letters, right? So um, for those who may be familiar, the longstanding practice up until about a month ago was that when an, when an ISL needed to be um, uh, you know published, uh, the process uh, you know was a pretty long, uh, arduous one that kind of makes its way up, uh, you know, here into into OSB. Uh, bounces around a bit informally within the NISPAC, uh, and then eventually lands on the desk of the undersecretary to sign. And we're usually able to get that done in about a six-year time period. <laughs> and, uh, thank you for the laughing in the background. It's, uh, it's actually a little bit faster than that, but definitely not as fast as it needs to be. Um, and so now that we sit here with a federal rule where the NISPOM is concerned, um, we have the opportunity to, to, to kind of a nod to that formality, meaning that when we want to issue guidance related to a federal rule, of course, there's a touch and go that has to be done with the folks who oversee that on behalf of the government at, at, at OMB. And so that process, uh, if we were going to do that at the same time that we do the process that I just previously described, then that six-year thing would become a whole lot more accurate than, than the joke that I intended a, a moment ago. And so um, we're happy for, uh, you, know, you know, a measure of agility. There will still be the need to have some review. Um, DCSA is a, uh, an awfully transparent organization as a way it addresses its responsibilities for the NISP. So I think um, we, we can all, um, uh, you know, have some confidence that, uh, that, um, that industrial secure letters, which are important, um, that they'll flow uh, with a little bit more efficiency than they, they had, uh, you know, in, in the past. And so um, that's a really a nod to, uh, to Allison and Laura here on my team uh, you know, to shepherd that through. If um, any of you have ever been to the dentist and they ran out of Novocaine, then you'll know a little bit about what policy issuance is like in the Department of Defense. And so to get something like that out was, uh, was no small feat, so uh, good, good on them. Um, so uh, let's see. That, uh, the, the last... Um, um, 
Yeah, well, so I basically combined the last of my two together there with the DOTI and the ISL process. And so um, other than that, uh, again, thank you uh, very much for the, uh, the the time and the opportunity uh, and, and to those who are in, the, uh, in attendance today. I hope you'll ask a lot of tough questions of Keith Minard. Um, uh, that concludes my remarks. Thank you, Jeff. We will now hear from Heath Minard, the Senior Policy Advisor with the Industrial Security Directorate of the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency. If you prepare a copy, give Jeff Spinnaker's email address and phone number and cell. So thanks, Keith Minard, DCSA. Um, so I'll be providing a date. We do have a speaker coming. In fact, just walked in the door for Embus. So um, sometimes travel arrangements a little bit of time, but it looks like we have that on, on the spot. So. Um, also, I'd like to open a few things because it's NCMS. Uh, make sure there's a lot of DCSA staff here providing sessions. They're providing overviews. They're supporting the help desk. Please take advantage of them right here, okay? Uh, they're here to help you and, and support questions you have and things you need to do. Uh, this week also is the doc as well. DCSA is awarding those. But um, I'd like to start a little bit as late Mark Bradley for time as the chair of the NISPAC, a very it's a very important role and it's a very hard role to bring this collection of uh, federal executive branch and industry together to address key policy issues related to this. And I really got to thank Heather Sims for the partnership and, and the, along the way as a spokesperson as well as the rest of the, of the NISPAC members that are leaving. I, I will go back to is, is I remember in 2016 at NCMS we had the NISPAC and that was the month after NISPOM 2 came out for inside threat. Heather and myself, we had a session one day in a small room. They moved us to the ballroom, and I think we couldn't see MS out for the insider threat session. So um, we go back a ways, and we've been through a lot of things, bringing things together than this, and we appreciate your time and your service to the business pack, Heather. Um, I do want to talk about a couple, something up front that's a little bit uh, different. Is we usually talk about key industry issues and things like that, but Heather and I have talked about this for a little while. And I thought I might be pointing to talk about this today at the NISPAC is um, the NISPOM and your requirements. They're not DCSA requirements. They're your contract requirements established by a FAR clause. Now, one thing that normally at the NISPAC don't do is, is really recognize DCSA and what they do. I really want to do that today. DCSA provides a wide range of tools, resources, and capabilities to help industry meet their contract requirements when it comes to this. So I just want to say, you know, it's a partnership out there. It, it, it builds upon that, and I think it's an important thing to acknowledge between the oversight, the tools, resources, the CDSE. Um, really, I mean, because it, that this that is really a technical specification. It's part of your statement of work. And, and I think that the agency as a whole provides a lot of things for industry to be successful in implementing its programs. Um, I'm going to start facility clearance timelines. I've got a few areas here, and I'll touch several topics. But you heard about the 90 study. Mr. Matt Kitzman's here. He'll be hosting some sessions on S sponsorship and guy. So stay tuned. The good news, though, is DCCA has transitioned two sets of indicators to evaluate the effectiveness and efficiency of the FCL process. The first is the inventory number for active initial, active initial and upgraded sale cases that is being considered a leading indicator. As of May 24, 2023, active and initial update FCL inventory was at a 10-year low of 451 cases. So as the inventory goes down, we'll find some more efficiencies. In fact, you can probably find some parallels in how, over the years, the personal security clearance process talked about the inventory, right? It's all that, that indicator to get to where a measurable state. Uh, this is a 58% reduction in the 10-year uh, average, which was 775. So we're making, definitely making improvements to bring those timelines down and to get those companies cleared faster. Um, of 451 cases that are currently total active upgrade seal inventory, 159 cases are open for 180 days, but this is also a 42% reduction over the 10-year average. So I, I think this is a, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a good news story. Um, we want to thank our entity vetting element to start bringing this together, bringing this down. It's a partnership. Um, it brings it together and makes things more efficient and gets companies to work faster. Um, and then the blast this pack we talked about the train models we use. Um, those those with no risk, those with indicators uh, in some complexity, and those that are uh, have risk indicators that require you risk mitigation. These are tier one, tier two, and three. But overall, the good news is that the numbers and timelines are going down. 
that inventory is becoming more manageable. And, and that goes back out to the industry vetting staff and industry working together to get to where we need to be. Um, real quick, uh, you know, public announcement, NCCS is out there, please use it. There's information on our website, and, and the NCCS team needs to work, and we'll continue to work closely with a NISPAC membership to go ahead and keep moving forward on the use of NCCS. It's really important that we start to get to the point where we're at a central repository of the, T, the 254s. It brings that information together in the right place. Uh, business rules and things allow consistency in application and development of the 254s, which is really important. Um, a bad 254 is like bad during classification, right? You put the wrong marking on something and it's just going. It doesn't stop. Uh, so it's really important that the 254 is done really well to make sure we have consistent and slow down contractual requirements. Uh, real quick, um, in, in the last NIST packing over the past couple of customer advisory boards, you've heard about our field restructuring. Um, those that don't know, DCSA this past December stood up a new operations organization. Um, the assistant director for field operations headquarters and regional directors are partially in place, about 75%. Um, we're moving forward. What this is is taking the field and integrating the, the function of the field into a single uh, command element. Whereas uh, in the case of industrial security, Mr. Uh, Matt Redding still provides the, the, the general mission guidance from an industrial security perspective, and the field executes in an integrated fashion with the ISSPs, the ISRs, the ESAs, and background investigators. Um, Heather mentioned a couple of things, and this is a couple of follow-ups to the lab in this pack and uh, a couple of key areas. Um, it was mentioned about the DCS Form 147. So uh, th there is this co the collaboration, and these are things that work well when we, when we engage. Um, we'll continue to use it for new facilities, but we'll work with industry um, on the bigger plan of implementing the 147s. I will say that um, I first got the DSA and I saw this like hard looking thing, how we approve safeguarding. I was really confused coming from the department security side. How do you even know what it looks like, right? So in the big picture, the 147 does give a, a solid perspective of your safeguarding requirements. It helps when a new FSO comes on board or a new ISR to better understand what security measures in place. So it, from a tool perspective, a really great opportunity to move forward. We understand the complexity of modifying these across the you know, four or four and a half thousand uh, safeguarding areas we have. Um, security review improvement. Uh, you heard about this the last couple of probably customer advisory boards. We understand the concerns and the and the, and the request from industry. We talk about uh, how the how the rating itself derived. Um, we'll be working with industry as we move through this year to make sure that we look at that and get to a state that that meets the needs of us of DCSA and oversight role and compliance and also better aligning the tool to better capture the actual rate itself. Thanks industry for all the attendance at this year's uh, industry uh, security conference. Uh, we went from one day to two day. We tried to expand the sessions a little bit broader um, to give a, bit, a little bit more takeaway than that. Uh, it's important that we use it a learning event. We want to make sure that people walk away after the time they spent, that there was, there was things learned, there was information gained. Um, for any government in the room, on August 16th and 17th, we'll have a two-day government security conference. Um, registration will open on June 15th. So the last thing I have before I turn it over to Mr. Mark Peckerel for um, an update on Embus is that um, I, I still have some time with DCA between December and April, but we want to make sure that we have a, a turnover of NISPAC membership to make sure that we, we align things, we have consistent application and representation um, over the next, so I see the next this pack is start tomorrow, right? We're getting done the session, we start tomorrow for November. So we will announce and we will be following up with the right documentation that Mr. Matt Roche and uh, Mr. Jason Terry will be taking over as the primary and alternate this pack member for DCSA. And uh, that allowed me to close out, I think, my 16th public meeting so I can, you know. But but really want to make sure there's a right seat ride and make sure we have a really good turnover on this because we don't want to have a break that engagement strategy. We want to make sure that the, the connectivity and everything with industry continues. So that's what, uh, I'm sorry, I have one more thing that Heather brought to my attention before I turn it over for Invis is, um, you know, we, we continue to go through uh, some questions on multi-facility organizations and two by fours. Stay tuned for information. 
Um, we know that the instructions for the 254, not only for this, but other areas need to be revised. But we're going to take an effort this year and look at the FY24, to look at 254 and its instructions, work with industry and government partners to make sure we look at getting this right on there to make sure that things are clear. And we'll get some uh, guidance out to our field personnel in between. So that's what I have. I'll take questions after the end of this, but Mr. Mark Peck will here can provide an end of study. Oh, oh, thank you, Gabe. So um, hello, everybody. As you can tell, I'm just getting here. Uh, flights were a little bit late out of BWI this morning. But I am here to talk about this, and this is going to be an extremely non-technical update. Um, the technical aspects of whatever interests or concerns or questions you have are going to be best managed um, throughout the remaining days of the uh, NCMS conference with the with the um, the NS technical folks that we brought down with us. Uh, for any of you who are at the uh, NCMS event last year in Minneapolis, you'll know that we started doing those help desks. They have been greatly expanded. Um, they turned out to be very uh, popular, very uh, welcome. So we're expanding on that, and we're going to have no end of opportunity for you to get the technical, the technical information that you want and need. So just at a very high level, um, everybody is aware that we're moving to the end of this. And one thing that I want to uh, make plain is what's going on now. The first step in the journey, uh, because this sometimes gets confused, is I say merely, uh, I use that advisedly, moving from eQuip to eApp as the platform by which you initiate individuals into the vet process. There's um, a lot of concern and, and some kind of inflation. Uh, maybe due to poor communication or mishearing things, that we're actually talking about the site management portions um, at this point with the equip to e transition. We're not. This is this is just um, getting you to where today you have to initiate an individual. You go to equip. We want to get you simply to tomorrow. It's another website. So that's really what we're talking about at this point in time for the move to end this. Um, you know, I've spoken about this with our federal customer agencies numerous times, and I'll repeat the message uh, here with you all. Um, we are committed to doing this, providing whatever resources we need and bringing them to bear, getting this accomplished this year uh, before the date has been set, October 1st. Um, but we need an equally strong commitment from uh, industry, as we requested a federal. Sorry, Senator Rose, this is Vaughn coming from NASA. The line seems to have gone out. We've lost the audio in the room. Yes. No longer receiving audio on this end. I'm going to text Heather. Hopefully she's got her cell phone with her. Yeah, I, I just texted her too. Um. Everyone online, I don't think they can hear us either. Please stand by. I'm sure we'll get the audio set up again in just a moment.
Well, I can break out awkward silence real quick. This is a very formal meeting. I will be doing a session tomorrow from one to two that talks about the life cycle. How do we get here for those old enough to remember, remember schoolhouse rocks, how a bill comes to law. We're going to put it in that format. And so it'll be a little bit more informal to talk about how we have different mechanisms within industry to find out what are the true issues, narrow it down with those issues. So a lot of the things that we're talking about here, we've already been talking about them for many, many years in different working groups. So it's intuitive. He, Keith knows what I'm going to say. I know what Spinner's going to say because we already know what the issues are. So this right here is where the, the public uh, meeting, but we don't always get down to the nitty-gritty of the actual details of what the issues are. So please, I ho hopefully I'll see you tomorrow from 1 to 2. It's only a one-hour session, and there will be also looking for um, what the issues that you're experiencing that we can actually bring into the umbrella and hopefully get you the right people while you're here. Um, bring in as an issue, we can work in a working group or um, to the right person in DCSA. Is that enough time? Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Great, right, fantastic. Uh, Mr. Peckerel, if you want to go ahead. Sure, okay. Um, so the, um, the detailed information on links to training, links to user account creation, things like that will be made available as we go through these uh, several days. Um, you know, hierarchy establishment, um, that is something that uh, has been done already by DCSA um, uh, for you, so you don't, unlike your fellow partners, you don't need to worry about doing that. Um, what we need you to do is understand the approach that we're taking. We're doing this in three phases. Um, we, we've taken the entire industry base uh, from a event perspective and divided it into annual submission uh, amounts of classifying groups. A small, medium, and large, and each has a large number of companies in there. Um, and uh, we'll be tackling them each in turn. And three are involved that we get to each group, requesting accounts, completing the training, receiving accounts, verifying the hierarchies, and then finally actually beginning submissions. Um, we are obviously motivated to try and do this as quickly as possible. Um, we understand that. We understand we still have gaps that we are trying to uh, plug and, and, and repair as we're going along. Uh, two examples have been encountered by the um, by the thorough community. Um, presently, uh, the, if you've got an individual who does not have a social security number, there's no way to initiate that person. That is scheduled for a fix and a release in September, so it's something that's been identified and uh, we're working on providing a solution to that. Similarly, uh, just the same the two examples I pulled, um, the lack of ability to download XML files with tabs, that is also that is also planned for a September release that are, it will be our last release of the fiscal year. So we're confident that our experience with the federal community has alerted us to those and whatever any other issues that we need to take a look at and resolve in order to make the system um, as effective as we all want it to be. But if, as you go through this, you identify or highlight anything else that you run into, please, please, please let us know. Um, there's a number of people who are wandering around these next few days. I'll refer to them generally as our Embus and customer support experts. Many of them are names that you, you know, people like Mr. Chuck Tench, um, Mr. Don Lewis, Mr. Mike Fuller, Mr. Sheldon Siltis, from my own team, Scott Glassick, Josh Fabon, and Eric Kreitzer. Seek them out. These are your experts. These are the people that are going to help you move from where you are now to a potential successful using of the, uh, of the system. As I said, we're going to have even more resources here for you this year than we did last year. Um, we're going to have start guides for you so that you can may take care of some things in real time. Um, but we really want to make this um, a partnership as we go along. Um, we've learned a lot from our experience of how to do it with the federal uh, customer base that we're hopefully now going to apply to our industry partners. And again, our goal is that by October 1st, all case emissions are going to be coming in via EAP as opposed to equip and that will give DCSA first real ability to, um, to sunset first to the let's see uh, systems that then this is building us uh, towards. So we're very much looking forward to the end of the fiscal year when we'll be able to do that. 
Um, more information is going to be made available to you also. I think how many, just a quick show of hand, how many folks in this room are aware of the quarterly meetings that DCSA's uh, industrial liaison group has, um, has established? I think the first one was in March or April. The next one is June 29th. Uh, we send out to uh, basically the entire FSO population. The entire FSO population. Um, we've upped our technical ability to handle thousands of attendees. So um, I encourage you, um, if you know about those, to come to those. If for some reason don't, seek out any of the gentlemen that I just heard, find out about them. Because of the sheer scope and size of them, it's possible to do a um, a real-time question, and I have this question, whatever. So it's, it's basically a transmit. But coming as it will at the end of June, after another month gone by, we'll be updating all the end this information that we're able to push out for you at that point as well. So that pretty much takes me to the end of what I came here to say, so I will turn it back unless there's anything else for me. Hey, Mark, Mark Rivers from the industry, Ms. Pat. I want to say something. Uh, this morning, um, Quentin Wilkes from L3 Harris and Jeremy Wendler from Northrop Grumman, they held a fabulous in this workshop that was about 300 plus individuals. That workshop was, was phenomenal because it pointed out a lot of FSOs that just don't get that information from a lot of settings. Um, there was a lot of hands up that had not actually created accounts, and they took the three hour block just to get those individuals walk, walking through that process this morning. So that workshop was phenomenal. So I just wanted to give a big shout to the this onboarding team and Quentin and Jeremy for actually putting that work out together. So thanks. And glad to know that I have them. Mark, I have one more question. Heather Jim's industry. There's still a lot of anxiety within industry about going to the NBIS because just two years ago we went from JPEG to DIS. So I, I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention it here. And the, the attendees here are going to get some one-on-one -on -one training. They attended the beginning this morning, which I popped in. It definitely, uh, you could have used a bigger room and a lot more hands-on, but thank you for industry helping industry. I mean, that's where it is. And that's the people who actually went to that course this morning to help your other partners in your areas um, as well. So we still have that, you know, we have to rely on government to help us bring the accounts and all of that. So be patient. We're going to get there. This is going to be for the betterment of all the national industrial security program once we get to one system, but it is going to be a struggle. We know it. We understand it. Um, but we have to be supportive because we have to get there. But there are some impediments and challenges that are unique to industry, um, maybe not just industry, but um, access to service now through PKI um, certificates. I know many of us are still having challenges, myself included, on um, being out there. What um, is being done to, to help um, understand the issues that the industry is having to get to the counts on board and um, get us to the next level? That sounds to me like a technical question if you're referring to actual the PKI issue. So I'm going to try and phone a friend here because he said I could if I needed to. Donnie, do you have something to say or show? Thanks, Mark. Hey, I'm uh, Donnie Lewis from the industry onboarding team. Yes, Heather, for your question, we have definitely been working with meeting with the MSOFs team, and we and they have also uh, been really trying to put some the, the need for that. You know, uh, Quentin and others have brought it up, and we've been working with them as well. Uh, one, try and get kind of a temporary uh, workaround that's not really a permanent one, one that will get you in using a credential, uh, but there is a, a more uh, long-term fix on the way, and uh, we've been working with that. I know right now it's just, uh, I believe, at the point it needs to get that uh, cyber awareness um, to to approve the, the whitelisting of the of the actual, it's called my access of that process to be allowed to, to use it. But, uh, yeah, certainly we know that that is a high priority on our end, and certainly have been uh, working to try and get that going. Okay, and don't go on there. Um, one of the other major concerns from the industry, and um, I know I'm speaking for people in the room as well as on the line, but those who aren't NCMS members as well, the concern about the data transfer, having good data that we trust in the system being transferred over, and we're not relying on resources from industry to put our own information to the system. How confident are we at um, the release in June that the information will be the force when we get to invest? 
Uh, so I can't say specifically on the date uh, exactly, you know, uh, whether or not, you know, the date or that date is going to get you exactly what you want. I can say that that, that is a continuing process that is being worked on by the NAD migration team uh, in NBIS. Make sure that that data is accurate and that it will, uh, you know, be as, as little of a lift as you guys can, uh, can have. So certainly we've learned lessons from that JPASS a different transition and are trying to use those lessons learned to, to make the job a lot easier on this time around. Thank you for that, and thanks for, sure. for being available for this question. Sure, no problem. So just uh, before I hand the mic one final time, there's a, your, um, the point you made about being anxious. Well, the industry is anxious about this and looking out for have a repeat of JPASS to this. Obviously, so is DCSA. Um, but this, for everybody's benefit here, this has clearly been communicated to all levels internally and externally that successful rollout, um, successful transition from equip to app. Everyone's still, I guess, what I'm because everyone's while I'll say e app equip. That's not what we're doing. Uh, but the transition is the number one priority for DCSA for the remainder of this fiscal year. And it's getting the executive attention, it's getting the leadership attention, the resource attention, financial attention, all the other necessary attention to make that happen. To your point specifically, so we don't have another incident or another experience like that. Thank you, Dan Dinkle, for this package. Do we have a question for CSA? Um, it's not about edit. Oh. <laughs> uh, industry comments to the CSA for being willing to take a look at their security review rating process uh, and system that they have. For large contractors who have access to dozens of security review processes and results across the country, uh, and they have the opportunity to just see how that yard stick applies from uh, region to region, build off of the field. I know a couple of years ago, in conjunction with the release of the new security review process, ECS, they all stood up quality control office and the quality control office was uh, identified in order to be able to uh, focus on any inconsistencies, resolve those inconsistencies and make sure the process was applied fairly and evenly across industry from region to region and build off of the field office. So I'm just wondering if you can comment on the quality control office, the staffing audit and what the results are that they've identified in terms of any consistency or inconsistency across the country. Well, I, if, if he looks over here, Mr. Matt Roach on quality assurance, this is a good step up for him. Now, on the other side, we do have uh, our phone number friend. We've got 27 people on teams right now in the background that helps us on things. But uh, I'll, I'll defer to Matt Roach or maybe even Lauren Fury, who's actually here in the room. Thank you, Keith. Uh, so this is Matt Witch again, and um, uh, thank you for the question, Jane. It's a good question. We do have a quality management program. It's actually led by uh, Ms. Lauren Fieri, to over here. Uh, she'll be here all week, as will our help desk. Uh, we have a whole team here on the help desk to talk about security, security reviews, secure, uh, the quality management program, and um, thank you. Uh, and anything else that's on your mind. Uh, but uh, in terms of sharing some data, so we're, we're just getting into a period in time where we have an update to look at to um, to enable us to start making decisions with. And one of those things that uh, we're going to use that data for is the uh, the academy that Mr. Redding is uh, spearheaded to stand up to get that consistency that we're looking for. As well as the um, the, uh, the security reading score, what we're, our aspirational goal is that we can both, on the industry and on the government side, get the same conclusion um, by following very simple and plain math, uh, logic, and, and agreeing upon the magnitude of the risk uh, embedded in that certain area. And that's really where we're working together with um, the NISPAC is going to be helpful so that we can um, see and agree. 
Um, so I'd love to talk a, a little bit more about the, the data when we start to get to that point where we share it with, with industry. But thank you uh, for the question. And just a one little add on it is one of the things we had this year and uh, Matt's been recently involved is, is we do have a Lean Six Sigma Green Bell project. Um, it's going to be take a component of this to review. So we do take you know, consideration on how we could use it for best practices and move that process. Thank you, Keith. I appreciate it. And I appreciate everyone's patience as uh, we work through the technical issues. Um, as a matter of fact, I now have two phones with me instead of just the one. Uh, and I did get a bunch of messages and emails. So, yes, uh, the sound was out. Um, next, we will hear from Salary Kerbin, the Chief of Policy and Collaboration with the Special Security Directorate with the National Intelligence. National Counterintelligence Security Center with the Office of Director of National Intelligence for her last public meeting. Valerie? Hello, Heather. Hello, everybody. And thank you very much, Heather. And thank you so much, Mark Bradley. Um, we want to thank you for your support and guidance along the way um, from ODNI. And much, much good luck in your retirement. So I'm going to provide you um, an update from the SECIA perspective. Um, you know, I like to brief you all on where we are and where we're going on trusted workforce. So most of you know, most of the framework of the high-level policies have been issued. We had a really good banner year in 2022. Um, right now, we're working on the implementation of all those policies. Um, so as of March 31st, we did issue our first tranche of implementation and the operational level guidance. This went out to our departments and agencies and the investigative service providers. There was two memoranda which were helping agencies um, get ready for their implementation of the transition to the three-tiered investigative model. And in the memorandums was the business, were the business rules and a crosswalk and also um, an FAQ. Um, even though it was distributed from us to the departments and agencies, ISOO always helps us to um, also distribute it to our NISPAC members. Next, we um, also this past spring, we work with the PAC and OPM to issue this third update to Trusted Workforce Implementation Strategy. And we include all the progress we have made each quarter. Um, this last version included three strategic adjustments um, to maintain the velocity of reform and ensure agency and ISP success. So we will continue our iterative approach to updating the implementation strategy. And of course, we asked our departments and agencies and their senior implementation officials to continue to modify your internal implementation plans. This implementation strategy was also um, sent through ISU to the NISPAC members. Um, let's see, our next area to talk about is, uh, we did issue the Federal Personnel Vetting Performance Management Guidelines last February, and then the standards this past September. And this these two documents describe the overarching strategic direction of personnel vetting performance management. And where we are now is we are working on the specific metrics that were found in the standards. And these metrics will help drive and show process improvement um, of what we've done to improve, you know, the enterprise and to help agencies make that risk-based approach. So we did an extensive review with the community. We are adjudicating the comments, and we really hope to issue this additional implementation guidance on the performance measures later this summer. And that will be a joint issuance um, of ODNI and OPM as the executive agents. Also coming soon are the national training standards for the background investigators. 
Um, this will be issued as well jointly. And um, this is where we got after the gaps of what was in the prior training standards to what investigators will need to know now for trusted workforce. So you will see that a lot of the information has um, remained similar. Um, we didn't do a wholesale, wholesale change. We just made updates and have a revised comparison of what investigators needed to know as the minimum standards and what they're going to have to learn now. Um, and also the training standards, we ensure that there is um, a refresher to ensure equal fair treatment in the entire investigative process. Then we've also completed national security adjudicator training standards. We did a gap analysis, we revised the learning objectives, um, and right now it's in for review through the DNI internal process. So both of those training standards you know, with a lot of hope, <laughs> everything will be issued by the end of the summer. These will be really good for the community to see and to start enhancing their training programs for the changes. Um, there will be a few other iterations of implementation. We're thinking about um, two or three more tranches will come out, but they will come out in the next couple of months and through the end of the year. Um, as Heather mentioned, we were part of the listening tours. The PAC PMO initiated um, these tours where we're speaking with the particular industry groups like NISPAC group, INSA, ISWIG, there'll be one for state and local tribal. And this is a wonderful opportunity for the executive agents and the um, PAC principals to hear industry's concerns, what are their pain points, and also to provide us some ideas for improvement and um, what we need to maybe do better in our communications. And of course, as we all work through that um, sharing of information. Um, an update on the NDA, that non-disclosure agreement, the SF-312, I'm sure you all recall, um, Archives issued the final regulation change last spring, and we are in the final stages of getting this signed by the ODNI. So the form that needs to be signed can be signed um, in wet signature with a witness, or it could be signed digitally. So the information for that approval is found in the regulation. However, agencies can use the old form to accept a digital signature now, but there will be a new form that will come out and agencies, once it's issued, should be using that new version. Um, I think that's it for updates from SECIA. Um, I just also want to thank you all um, for being partners with ODNI, and um, it's been a long time. I think I've served NISPAC when I was with NRC for a couple of years and here at ODNI, so it's probably close to eight years I've been involved with NISPAC, and it's been a wonderful experience and a great opportunity to learn what you all are doing in your agencies and so we could work together to get after any of the concerns we all have. And, you know, of course, we're all working to have a better personnel vetting process and improve how to onboard the talent and retain the talent in the government and industry. So thank you again for all the partnerships. Um, I do miss being in person and meeting you all and interacting, but hopefully our paths will cross again soon. So thank you to ISU, um, Heather, and Robert. You've been great partners. And um, hope you all enjoy the rest of your conference. That's all I have, Heather. Thank you, Valerie. Are there any questions for ODNI? I know I personally get a lot about SF312, and I redirect them. All right, thank you, Valerie. Up next is Mr. Rob McCrae, the Director of the National Security Services Division with the Office of the Chief Security Officer at the Department of Homeland Security for their update. Rob? 
Uh, hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, Joe, we can. Great. Uh, not much to report here from DHS. Uh, we uh, continue to uh, make implementing Trusted Workforce uh, 2.0 a priority, uh, making headway in the continuous vetting uh, enrollment of our national security population. We're just about, uh, about 100%. Uh, also with the uh, wrap back and, and, uh, and other critical elements of that uh, as well. Uh, but other than that, uh, not much other to report. We just appreciate the, the partnership that we have uh, with DCSA and as they continue to support our industrial security program uh, as well. And I uh, would like to wish uh, Mark Bradley uh, all the best in his future endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, any questions for DHS? All right, the next update we will hear from is Mr. Mark Hynoski, the Director for the Office of Security Policy with the Department of Energy. Mark? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to actually let Tracy go first to create our slides. He has, he has to drop off for another commitment. Okay, thank you, Mark. This is Tracy Kendall, Department of Energy Personnel Security Policy Program Manager. Uh, first of all, before we get into the slides, I just want to say on behalf of the department, uh, we want to congratulate Mr. Mark Bradley, Valerie Kerbin, and Keith Miner uh, on their retirements and service to the nation, and we wish you well in retirement. Additionally, the Department of Energy wants to also thank Heather Sam for her service as the NISPAC industry spokesperson. So thank you all. So if you're following along with me on the slides, I'm on slide two right now. Um, and so for this particular slide, overall DOE continues to meet FERPA goals and on average over the last four quarters. Now we did have some hiccups with our adjudication for top secret PRs um, over the, um, the last four quarters. But again, we're, we're making our ERPA numbers. Uh, slide three. Uh, this is one of our good news slides here. Over the last year, we met or exceeded the initiation and adjudicated uh, goals and expect that trend to continue for the um, fastest 90% for initial top secrets. Next slide. Uh, the monthly time list for the fastest 90% of initial secrets. Um, we met and exceeded this one again over the last year, so, um, you know, nothing other than to Nothing more to report other than good news for that particular slide. Next slide is T5Rs. Uh, we continue to meet this, the initiation goal, and since last August, some of the months have been kind of hit and miss. But again, overall, we're meeting the work per goal on average, and over the last 12 months, our adjudication um, timeliness was at 19 days. And for the last slide for the uh, secret T3 reinvestigations. Uh, no major changes, and our average timeliness for adjudication for this particular slide was uh, 18 days. Now that concludes my briefing for the slides. And as we always say, if our industry partners have any concerns for DOE from an industrial security perspective, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're ready to assist uh, where necessary. Um, this concludes our briefing. Heather, subject to any questions. All right, thanks, Tracy. Um, next, we will hear from Mr. Dennis Brady, the Chief of Security Management and Operations Branch, Branch giving the Nuclear Regulatory Commission update. Dennis? Yes, hello. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. A uh, couple of comments from the NRC. I just want to give a quick update on our NIST program, it uh, continues to oversee the clear contractors. We're ramping up to our pre-COVID operational tempo. Under CUI, uh, the NRC continues to meet with other agencies and our stakeholders to share the NRC's CUI program and our plan for implementation. The NRC has made great strides in developing our CUI program, but the program is yet to be fully stood up due to implementation challenges raised by you know, federal departments and agencies along with our stakeholders. I want to talk a little bit about SEED-3, which is uh, uh, one of the uh, big accomplishments uh, for the agency. We've launched a uh, 
C3 Foreign Travel Reporting Portal. It's been operational since January 23 for all cleared employees and contractors to use to report their foreign travel. The portal provides the traveler a timely feedback for approval for foreign travel. The portal guides the traveler through the reporting requirements and allows for the travel traveler to make pre-travel edits and post-travel updates. Very proud of this. In addition to providing the means for cleared personnel to gain foreign travel approval, the portal allowed the agency a venue to, to remind the staff of certain security policies for those going on foreign travel, such as not traveling overseas with your PIV card and or not taking your agency laptop overseas. Uh, since we've uh, implemented those reminders and made that a mandatory checkbox on the portal, we haven't had any uh, infractions of that nature since then. So that uh, concludes my remarks, and I'll pass it back to you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Any questions for the NRC? Okay. Next, we hear from Kelly and Jen giving the Central Intelligence Agency update. Ladies? Good afternoon. This is Kelly Patrick. Don't have much of an update. Um, Jen is not on the call. Um, we're just continuing to work at meeting 100% of CE enrollment. We're getting pretty, pretty close. Um, we're also working towards the Trusted Workforce 2.0 implementation. So that's about it. Thank you, Kelly. Any questions for the CIA? All right. We're now moving to the portion of the meeting where we get reports from the NISPAC working groups. However, we will not be discussing all the working groups at this time. We have provided slides with highlights of all of them. We will only be hearing about the Clearance Working Group and the NISP Information System Authorization, also known as the NISA Working Groups at the time. You have already heard from some CSAs and CSOs on the high-level points of what was discussed during the Clearance Working Group on May 3, 2023. We will also hear from DCSA for their security clearance and information systems metrics, along with metrics from the NRC, since we already heard from DOE. We are now going to hear from Mr. Dave Scott, the NIST authorizing official for DCSA's information systems update. Dave? Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, just a few slides here on some high-level national metrics I'm on the national metrics slide uh, next week. And um, what we've discovered is that our partnership with the NISA Working Group continues to um, provide monumental success and transparency in, in our operational uh, model uh, for, for authoriza set and authorization of system. The tradition a year and a half ago that we made uh, changes in the workflow, uh, to the package workflow, uh, getting industry first an insight into where their packages are along the process has proved beneficial uh, for both industry and us. And now we have some national metrics giving more detailed analysis and timelines into that. Um, so high-level metric here on the left-hand side, um, systems authorization status, that is a portfolio of our systems, which is around 5,500 systems. About two years ago, we were roughly around 6,400 systems. Uh, we continue to stabilize at 5,500 systems where we um, have rid of systems that have expired or there's no longer a contractual requirement uh, for processing. So we, we've uh, discovered that our, our, our view is pretty much stabilized at 5,500. Um, what you'll see on the pie chart there is um, our authorization status uh, between the ADO, which is a fully authorized system where uh, typically it's up to three years, and a conditional authorization, which is there in red. Uh, I'm happy to report just from a trend perspective, we're continuing to see more full three-year authorizations. That's due in large part because our active uh, participation getting out off-site post-COVID to conducting uh, those uh, risk reviews. Uh, we're going to continue to stress that importance move forward. Um, moving on to the bottom uh, is uh, really what's uh, been beneficial is giving more insight in industry and for us uh, within uh, DCSA is insight into what is our timelines. How many uh, DCSA days does it take for us to set an authorized system? And we are right at 50 days uh, from an active workflow standpoint. So uh, we recommend having a fully uh, completed package with 90 days and DCSA time. Now, there is back and forth there uh, between industry and government, uh, just, just situational awareness. Extension, that is a um, regional authorization official tool. Uh, when um, 
uh, for whatever circumstance, if there's communication we cannot get onto a site or if there is a, maybe a high-level vacancy in an office, we do have the flexibility uh, to extend authorization as well. Communication is key uh, from that local level, ISSM, the ISSP, and team leads in regional authorization that's appropriate. Um, next slide. Uh, the contractor uh, triage metrics or SCARs uh, is what a uh, process that we uh, did a few years ago is continuing to, to prove beneficial uh, across the board. Um, you'll see their packages assessed to date 5,000. There's a lot of ingested packages coming in. Really, three decisions made uh, complete, which is a uh, fully complete package just passed on to the ISP for the next steps of review. Uh, we work where maybe some, something simple, bottom left corner, the top three uh, items for return, which typically um, Lack or, uh, lack or incomplete implementation plan, or it could be as simple as uh, putting the requirement with your requirement to process classify. Um, the tree up metrics uh, uh, that I'm, I'm most proud of the report is just uh, the return for re rework. When we first started triage, uh, it was actually in, in FY20, but we did not have metrics at the time. It was well over 50% return rate. We're down, I know it says 31% or FY23. It's uh, actually a little bit lower than that. We made some enhancements within EMAS for required fields that caused a little bit of a hiccup for more return um, that we've kind of worked through. So uh, that's a little bit high, but it's, almost, uh, it's not a true representation. It's actually a lot lower than that. So industry doing a much better job on um, the following the job base that, are, that we've posted in, in uh, our system of record. Next slide, please. Uh, as been, had been discussed here at the NISPAC, uh, we're very happy to report um, the NISC Cloud Pilot success. Uh, probably a lot longer than much uh, all of us anticipated, uh, both government and industry. Um, but, uh, learned a lot uh, about that uh, that work that, that pilot. Um, it's a working group in the DCSA. We had a, a very extensive uh, walkthrough of the pilot uh, about six to eight weeks ago, where we walked through the pilot from 16 months ago to where we are today, answered a lot of questions for industry. And um, what we determined was uh, there are no policy impediments uh, for industry to, uh, to procure uh, and process classified in the cloud. There was a provisional authorization for an isolated secret region issued by DISA uh, in January. And our, we were happy to report that in March of this year, we did issue an, uh, an, a conditional authorization for the defense contractor. Um, we are now working on uh, a few other uh, uh, projects uh, in the same uh, area. So we're going to continue to learn. We're going to continue to um, get our best practices and communicate be as transparent as possible in this award group uh, partnership. Um, as was stated earlier, what we've discovered is uh, some of the challenges, I think, uh, is to, to, um, that we worked through uh, was the acquisition piece, the DFARS, as Mr. Spinner talked about earlier. Um, but we do have, uh, through Keith, we have some ideas that we, we'd like to, to work with um, in partnership there. So we've got that. We also know that the government sponsorship is key. Uh, it's just from the enabling of the ability, uh, so just the way that it, uh, the architect, it's architected, uh, the cloud server offering. The other thing that I want to stress on, and you'll hear probably at, at some of the, the sessions this week, is uh, set zero of RMS, uh, making sure that the right stakeholders are at the table. ISSM, program management, leadership. Um, I think that's going to save a lot of time, uh, energy, and effort from start to finish if, um, if preparation is, is done well, well up front. So uh, very happy with the success there. I'm moving on with the DEPM uh, 3.0. Uh, we are very close to handing it over to the uh, NISA working for an informal review. I, I'd say sometime this summer. I'm hoping it's going to be done a little bit sooner, but uh, we're, we're final coordination uh, here at the headquarters level. Um, the key things that we're looking to do there is really kind of clean up some of the gaps that we've heard over the couple of years, um, both from industry and also internally, uh, making sure that there's clear, uh, consistent guidance uh, in this document. And we're going to uh, make sure they're trying to align uh, to, to CNSS, uh, 1253, and associated instructions, um, as well as uh, upping the, the, the language for 32 CFR Part 107. One of the key things in the DAPM that, that I'm, I'm most proud of and very excited about is uh, we've been hearing a lot about uh, requesting guidance to how to share uh, a single system um, uh, or multiple programs, multiple contracts. Uh, it can be done. DAPM does not have clear uh, guidance in there. 
Um, and we have, uh, have some draft guidance that we actually worked and tested out a little bit on the flight pilot, and it was extremely successful. So we're excited to get that out uh, and share it with the community uh, because we think it's going to answer a lot of mail. Heather, we seem to have lost the audio again. Please stand by, everyone. Everyone, they're working to have us reconnected to the meeting. Please stand by.
was out from NCIE, and maybe that's the, that's a launch point of that. No, I, I actually have one more. Uh, just to work with two and I'm pretty good under pressure um, for those who don't know me. Um, ODI mentioned about the new form. PRs, as we know, are changing, and they're looking at this new form to do the, um, the supervisor recommendation on your cleared employees. We, industry NISPAC members, MOU members, are collecting um, some concerns that we're going to have as we move forward with Triple Force 2.0. We are, that is one of our items. And um, as you're doing listening tours with PMO, anything else that you can think of, make sure that you're talking to Matt Eames. He is in attendance, this guy also believe. So maybe he'll get some people together and talk about what does the future look like for personal security. I tell you, it looks great, looks bright. Um, when we can get a person hired and work, work within, you know, that same week, that is the end state is being immediately processing people and getting that vetting done. You're welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Heather, hair gone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, if I could just have our event producer say that she near us, and I acknowledge it so that we can both hear each other. We can hear you online now. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sorry about that, everyone. You were in the middle, correct? Yes. Okay. Mike, back to you. All right. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Slides up there? Okay. Um, yeah, so for it's end timeliness for investigations for the T5 initials, um, looking at an FY23Q2, uh, we'll break down a bit. Uh, 20 days for initiation, 107 days for investigation, and then 10 days for education. So that gives you an end timeliness, a total of 137 days. Uh, the T3 initials, FI23Q2, um, again, we'll break that down. 20 days for initiation, 63 days for investigation, and 19 days for adjudication. That gives you an end to timeliness of 102 days. 90% uh, of the initial investigation had an interim determination uh, on average within 7 to 10 days. And then the, uh, yeah, so total investigation inventory uh, ending with BI. The, at the T5 level is 13,600, and then T3 is at 14,600. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, move forward. We'll talk about the DOD CAS. Um, so looking at DOD CAS inventory, um, uh, inventory trends in F, since Q3 FY21, um, current open adjudication case inventory for industry contract personnel um, is about 29,000 cases. Um, now, that inventory includes customer service requests, incident reports, tier background investigation, and continuous vetting alerts. Uh, because that inventory numbers include the continuous vetting alerts, um, you can see as, as the number of people enrolled in continuous vetting has increased and the number of data sources has increased, there's been an increase in inventory. Um, those most serious alerts are prioritized to mitigate risk. And then for reciprocity, the CAC continues to deliver reciprocity decisions that average one calendar day. Um, also from the CAC perspective for industry conditionals, um, in coordination and partnership with VRO and the NISPAC, um, DOD CAS beginning to define the process to issue conditional national security eligibility determinations. The, the conditions support mission readiness by removing aids from due process and using continuous vetting to monitor compliance and support risk mitigation. Um, once that process is defined, additional communication materials are going to be provided on industry conditionals and will be distributed to industry and across the department once available. And moving along to vetting rate operation updates, um, on March 27, 2023, this release 13.17 included updates to continue with vetting reason code on the user interface and reports within DISC. Records had other and deferred will now be reflected as enrolled. 
in the disk JVS user interface, users will see, see the enrollment status as enrolled, unenrolled, and no records found. The corresponding date associated with enrolled or unenrolled will also be visible. Records found indicates that the individual is not enrolled in CV, and reporting CAS and GDS and CAS will display a CV status of enrolled, unenrolled, or never enrolled and the date. In reports, never enrolled is a status for no records found. The most recent date of enrollment status will populate in this subject report and not to sort the identification of the timeline for the SF86 update. For CV alert uh, management, post CV enrollment alerts are generated based on the first thresholds which align with federal investigative standards and adjudicated guidelines. Um, CV is impactful as we average about 6% alert rate. Criminal and financial are the most common valid actionable alerts. Thus far, FY23, Vero has received 13,000 industry alerts, which 6,347% were not previously known from 5,600 unique industry subjects. So note this information should have self-reported and as our goal is moving forward to have individual self-report information as it occurs. Depending on any questions, those are the updates. All right, thank you, Mike. Any questions for Daro? Okay, for those of you on the phone, it's my understanding that the audio actually went out um, with uh, Dave Scott. Um, so I apologize, but the minutes will reflect what you should have heard for those on the phone. So now we are at uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's update. Mr. Heilig, are you on the phone? Hi, Heather, I'm here. Um, so thank you, everybody. Uh, first, let me just say congratulations to anyone who's on the verge of retirement. I'm incredibly jealous. Um, in terms of the slides, I'm not going to go one by one. Um, the, the gist of it is that for the most part, we're hitting our ERTA adjudication timeliness numbers. Um, we had a few hiccups with some PRs. Um, we're not running nearly as many PRs, thankfully, uh, now due to continuous vetting, but those that we did run, um, we, you know, we ran into some issues that needed uh, a lot of uh, additional work on our end to clear those out. Um, but as I said, I, I'm happy to report that for the most part, our ERPTA numbers are being hit or, or exceeded, and we're, we're not seeing any real issues there. Um, in terms of the EQIP to eApp transition, I'm happy to report that the NRC has fully transitioned to eApp. Uh, the, both on the Fed side and the contractor side, and we, we actually are finding that the system works quite well and hearing uh, positive feedback from the applicants who are entering information. Um, with continuous vetting, our cleared population is enrolled, as, as it should be, and we're internally gearing up for the uh, enrollment for the public trust uh, population. Um, we're making some updates to our systems and, and, you know, getting ready for that large population that will need to be enrolled and potentially require some reinvestigations to get them um, new forms or maybe not reinvestigations, but at least reaching out to get new forms. So that, that'll that be a large undertaking, but what, what we're getting ready for it. And in terms of rat back, we're about 85% there as, as a whole population. Um, just running into, you know, some issues getting folks to get fingerprinted again. But that's getting easier and easier as we kind of emerge from the, the COVID rock. Um, I really don't have any more information, but I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Any questions for NRC? All right, as requested, we are going to go back to DCSA with Dave Scott to discuss uh, the NIST CPG and CCRI. Dave? Yeah, no problem. Um, so the NIST action process guide was developed in partnership uh, internally and also coordinated uh, last year with a NIST working group. So it's been coordinated informally, um, and we're going to, in parallel with the DAPM uh, revisions, when we're ready there, we're going to coordinate both of those for final release to the, the new process. So uh, we're, we're looking to do that here in the very near future. Um, Commands for Ready Inspection, uh, DCSA is standing up uh, its own dedicated CCRI teams. Um, 
Where so you're going to see an increased presence, uh, probably uh, up to double next year, our presence um, and intentionally more, uh, uh, definitely more over the coming years, where we will be uh, conducting CRIs on those industry connections uh, with approved uh, access to Cipernet um, in the very near future. So, and then last topic, if, if I got to cut off with uh, something that we're, we're, we need to, we're looking to improve upon is our MOU coordination process. We're looking to find efficiencies in working with other government agencies and obviously on your behalf for any requ contract requirements to connect to other government networks. Um, it, it's a lead out of our headquarters operation, um, and we're looking to find uh, ways of automation uh, in any way possible. So we've got some ideas. Uh, we're going to team up with Mr. Sadler and then this is the working group team uh, to, to see what makes sense to really help you guys out uh, as it relates to MOUs. And any any questions? All right, any questions? Uh, I'm sure there aren't um, for those uh, in the room. All right, uh, we're now going to hear from Mr. Perry Russell Hunter, the Director of the Defense Office of Hearings and Appeals, also known as DOHA. I know that he was being to be in person, but unfortunately was needed back in D.C. Perry? Yes, thank you so much, Heather. And I want to um, start out by uh, thanking uh, Mr. Mark Bradley for his distinguished and really exceptional federal service. Um, I, I, I know I, I, I did this back in November when I thought I was saying goodbye, uh, but I'm going to do it again because um, in addition to being a, a distinguished and revered public servant, uh, Mark Bradley is also uh, an accomplished author. And so I just want to say that I hope that uh, Mark will write some more books. Um, I'm looking forward to reading them uh, if and when I ever get to retire. Uh, in the meantime, uh, but you know, before we let him retire, I just wanted to e echo Jeff Spinninger's words about uh, Mark Bradley's leadership because Mark represented exactly what we in government strive for, clarity of guidance, transparency of process, and ultimately the ability to balance competing interests in a way that serves the taxpayer and the public very well. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Heather Harris-Pagan and, and, and Robert Tringali for all of the hard work and planning that went into taking this first post-pandemic in-person NISPAC on, on the road to New Orleans. Um, and, and while I am not there to enjoy it, I, I wanted to make sure that we thank them for all of the work that went into this. Um, there are multiple pieces of good news in personnel security as uh, far as uh, what Doha is seeing. Um, first of all, uh, I want to say that Doha is, is timely with its legal reviews of industrial contractor statements of reasons. Um, we currently have just 241 uh, statements of reasons reviews pending with us. Uh, that's well within the norm of the working inventory of SORs we review in a month, which is about 300. Uh, that means that on average, SORs are getting their Doha legal review within 30 days. Um, so the, this is the first piece of good news because it means that uh, timely notice is getting out to industry uh, uh, cleared employees and applicants for clearances um, about whom issues have been revealed by either continuous vetting or were, were found in their investigations. Um, Second, as uh, Mike Ray just noted, uh, DCSA Consolidated Adjudication Services, or CAS, is working on an initiative whereby uh, we're, they're going to start uh, issuing conditional clearances in industry. Uh, this is uh, uh, also a great innovation because it's going to be leveraging CV, which means that we're, uh, we're not going to be putting emphasis on uh, the FSOs having to do uh, something. Um, and it also means that the, the CAS is, is getting the issue uh, information sooner, which means that they should be able to produce a robust resolution of issues sooner as well. Uh, this is all good news. Um, and finally, uh, if and when a case does need to go to administrative due process, uh, Doha is uh, continuing to steadily increase uh, the number of hearings that we're holding using secure uh, remote video technology over the DOD version of Teams. Um, and in addition, we've got Doha administrative judges and department counsel traveling more uh, than they have in the past two years. Obviously, uh, that was constrained during the pandemic. There are some cases that lend themselves to more in person. For example, if we have um, expert witnesses for mental health cases, it would just be one example. 
Um, I also want to pause here to thank uh, Valerie Kerbin for her exemplary federal service. Um, and uh, I remember when she used to give the NRC brief, and I uh, uh, just want to thank her for all the work she's done at ODNI as a security executive agent. Um, among the many initiatives she discussed uh, was one emphasizing fair, equal, and unbiased treatment. Uh, those are obviously essential aspects of what Doha does. Um, Doha also trans uh, ensures our transparency uh, by showing our work. Um, every industrial contractor clearance eligibility decision made by Doha since uh, November 1st of 1996 uh, by either a Doha administrative judge or by the Doha appeal board is published in redacted form. It means we take the personal identifiers out um, on the Doha website. Uh, that's HTTPS, um, Doha, dot OGC dot OSD dot mil and then a little slash. So um, again, Doha is part of the Office of General Counsel within DOD um, that allows us to uh, review, uh, conduct hearings and uh, uh, provide due process in a way that is independent from the investigation and the adjudication. So uh, with that said, um, I will stop and take any questions. Thanks, Perry. Uh, if I have any say, you're never going to retire. Um, any questions for Doha? All right, we're now going to move on um, for an update on the Controlled Unclassified Information Program. And I will give that as the executive agent uh, is ISOO. As a reminder, it is still a requirement to safeguard and handle CUI in accordance with Executive Order 13556 and 32 CFR Part 2002, the Implementation Directive for CUI. One of the highest priorities of ISU as a CUI Executive Agent is getting a CUI Federal Acquisition Regulation case, also known as a FAR Clause, issued. This will create a common mechanism to communicate which information contractors trade for and receive from the federal government must be protected, how to protect it, and who it can be shared with. Currently, laws, federal regulations, and government policies already mandate the protections. Once the FAR clause is issued, it will be a standard vehicle for conveying whether CUI is involved in the contract and what the existing requirements are for safeguarding it. The CUI Interagency Policy Committee, or IPC, process has been initiated and ongoing. CUI noticed 2022 Tax 01 provides executive agent guidance regarding the White House National Security Council memorandum, initiating a process to review information management and classification policies of June 2nd, 2022. If you have questions on what ACs are participating in the CUI program and what waivers may be in place for them, please do not hesitate to reach out to CUI at nara.gov. We are now at the point of the meeting where we ask for NISPAC members to present any new business that they may have. Anyone? All right. Do any other members have questions or remarks? Okay. For the folks in the room, uh, please make sure you sign in for the attendance. It does have your email address for everyone that is in person. In that called in, a survey will be sent to everyone. You will have about two weeks to complete it. Um, I am aware that we had technical issues, um, but other than that, please feel free to put anything else in there that would be beneficial for the next time. Our next NISPAC is scheduled for Wednesday, November 15th, 2023. We hope to have the meeting in person at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. As a reminder, all NISPAC meeting announcements are posted in the Federal Register approximately 30 days before the meeting, along with being posted to the ISO Overview blog. A huge thank you for those with NCMS that made this reality and helped us throughout the meeting. And thank you for those that stuck it out, both uh, the people, the NISPAC members, the speakers, and the attendees in the audience. I really appreciate you uh, being patient with us. And with that, meeting is adjourned. Thank you for your time.